Hello and welcome to another episode of Lights Out, your virtual campfire. I'm your hostess with the mostest ghosties, Sylvia Schultz. You guys all know how much I love Peoria State Hospital. You say haunted mental asylum and your mind goes all American horror story on you and you assume there was pain and fear and abuse. That wasn't the case at my beloved Peoria State Hospital. But the terrible reputation of other asylums was sometimes well earned. Possibly the worst of these in the United States was the notorious Penhurst Asylum. If you're brave enough, take my hand as we go lights out. Penhurst State School and Hospital, located outside Philadelphia, was an institution for the mentally and physically disabled. Originally known as the Eastern Pennsylvania State Institution for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic, it opened in November 1908 and overcrowded within four years of its opening. As was so common in those days, the institution housed not only the handicapped, but was also used as a warehouse for orphans, immigrants, and criminals. In 1913, the Commission for the Care of the Feeble-Minded was set up, and these were not compassionate folks. The Commission reported that those with disabilities were unfit for citizenship. Even worse, the patients posed a menace to the peace. By the mid-1960s, Penhurst was facing a budget shortfall of $4 million. Buildings were desperately overcrowded, and patients were strapped to their beds simply because there were not enough staff to care for them. Abuse was rampant, and administrators were helpless. Most of the 2,791 patients at Penhurst were children. Only 200 of the residents were allowed to take part in any sort of art therapy or recreation, or even basic education. This in spite of the fact that many of the patients were high-functioning and could have benefited greatly from compassionate care and encouragement. But with only nine doctors and 11 teachers on staff, none of whom had any training in special education, the patients were left to fend for themselves. Patient-on-patient -patient violence was common and dealt with in ways that were both lazy and vicious. In an expose on Penhurst in 1968, a doctor explained how he dealt with a bully that had terrorized another patient. The doctor asked his colleagues what sort of injection he could administer that would cause the most pain to the patient without permanently injuring him. Then he gave the bully that shot. It was this expose, a report filed by Bill Baldini in 1968 for WCAU-TV, that blew the lid off the excruciating conditions at Penhurst Asylum. The video was hard for viewers to stomach. Children strapped to beds, naked patients rocking back and forth, lost in their own private misery. Most heartbreaking were the images of infants and toddlers in metal cages, helpless in their incarceration. Baldini asked one of the boys if he could have anything, anything in the world he wanted, what would it be? To get out of Penhurst was the quiet, plaintive reply. It took a couple of decades, but in 1986, the states finally decided that Penhurst must be closed. It closed its doors for good on December 9, 1987. The remaining patients were moved into small homes housing three people or fewer. All care plans were discussed with the patients and their families. At long last, someone was listening to the voices of Penhurst. But all was not hopeless at the asylum. In the beginning, Penhurst was held up as a model institution, albeit for the wrong reasons. 
In the era in which it opened, the solution to physical and mental disability was segregation, keeping them out of sight and out of mind, and even forced sterilization. But glimmers of compassion shone through. One Penhurst staff member recalls how she and others would volunteer their time on Saturdays and Sundays to clean the residents, many of whom were incontinent, because the state budget did not provide for staffing on weekends. Another employee welcomed patients into her own home for holidays when their own families stopped visiting them. Even more compelling than these stories, though, is the unbreakable spirit of the patients who endured their time at the institution. Working patients helped staff care for their worse-off peers, and many patients went on to live lives of dignity and worth when released from Penhurst. The name of Penhurst remained, though, as the shame of Pennsylvania, and a cautionary tale for other institutions that promised to care for the indigent and the mentally ill. It was perhaps inevitable, given its horrifying history, that Penhurst would get a reputation for being extremely haunted. It seems that every building has its share of spookiness. In the Quaker building, shadows appear and disappear. Investigators have been shoved hard enough to leave red marks on their bodies. Loud sounds and voices can be heard coming from the Philadelphia building, even when no one is in there. In the Hershey building, staff have seen curtains parting on the second floor. Only there is a metal grate that separates the curtains from the room. No living human can physically get to the curtains to move them. Investigators in the Philadelphia tunnels are told to get out. Children's voices are often heard in the playroom in the Devon building. The day we visited Penhurst was a rainy summer morning. The geography of that area of Pennsylvania is interesting. Its proximity to the Allegheny Mountains gives it its own unique microclimate, and heavy rains are common in the summer. Our group signed in at the administration building and got a quick tour of the campus. Dale Kasmerick was there with members of Ghost Research Society, as well as folks from Crawford County Ghost Hunter Society and Ghost Head Soup. We were turned loose to do our own exploring. We wandered the grounds, marveling at the way the buildings were being reclaimed by the implacable grasp of nature. Whatever metal was there was rusted, whatever wasn't rusted sagged, and everything, everything was choked in vines and neglect. We knew Penhurst was long deserted, but the whole place felt alive, vibrant with the life of things growing unchecked out of all human control. Everywhere we looked was a wet riot of green, the vines and trees looking almost feral in their hunger to consume the buildings. The administration building where our tour began also houses a small museum. The museum, in the interest of historic accuracy, has set up several displays on the background of the infamous institution. I captured some of these displays for you. History of Penhurst the Penhurst story, the story of a world apart, is many different stories. It is a story of fear. It is a story of science gone terribly wrong. It is the story of a place built to be forgotten. But most importantly, it is the story of the more than 10,600 people for whom Penhurst became home. Originally called the Eastern Pennsylvania Institution for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic, Penhurst was built in 1908 on a 634-acre lot 35, 35 miles northwest of Philadelphia. In 1918, the chief physician at Penhurst stated, Every feeble-minded person is a potential criminal. 
The general public, although more convinced today than ever before that it is a good thing to segregate the idiot or the distinct imbecile, they have not as yet been convinced as to the proper treatment of the defective delinquent, which is the brighter and more dangerous individual. At least half of the people admitted to Penhurst died there. All paid a price for society's mistaken notion that they belonged there. By the late 1960s, the average cost per person at Penhurst was $5.90 per day. The average cost of keeping a leopard at the Philadelphia Zoo was $7.15 per day. In spite of the exposure of the atrocities at Penhurst, families remember it as the only option they were given when they needed help to support a relative with an intellectual or developmental disability, so the waiting lists grew and the crowding continued. By the late summer of 1968, Bill Baldini, a TV reporter for Philadelphia's Channel 10 CBS affiliate, learned about the conditions at Penhurst, and at first didn't believe it until he made a personal visit. His visit led to his five-day expose that played out before the region's dinner tables, the late news, and then the nation. The general public was shocked by the revelations, but those who already knew of Penhurst were not. It was hoped that with this exposure, perhaps something could be done to improve the conditions that existed. Maybe this time, the expose would lead to needed changes. Positive changes would eventually come, but not through additional funding, buildings, painted walls, or holiday parties. Change came when family members and a caring community finally said, enough is enough, and combined their efforts into one of the greatest civil rights movements in our nation's history. The crucial lesson we must learn from the Penhurst story is not why it failed or what would have been needed to make it succeed. From the day it was conceived, Penhurst, and all of the facilities like it, were the wrong answer to the wrong question. They could not succeed because the underlying idea behind their creation was wrong. No one needed to be sent to a world apart. J. Gregory Pierman, former Penhurst employee. The doors of Penhurst were finally closed in 1987 after almost two decades of complex litigation. Over 3,000 children and adults left this terrifying and dangerous place during this period alone. From tragedy towards an everyday life, more than 10,000 unique individuals passed through the doors of Penhurst where they would spend part of their lives in deep segregation. But these people's lives were not in vain. They served as a testament to the human spirit and helped reveal the truth. Institutional models have failed. They do not contribute to healthy lives, healthy relationships, or personal growth, and they have failed to create valued roles in society where all can contribute. The big question, were people better off after they left Penhurst? When Judge Broderick issued his order in 1977 guiding the closure of Penhurst with a clear message that Penhurst denied people the right to adequate treatment and freedom from harm, many people were worried. Could people be safe and free in the community? Would they be able to adjust and engage? The results were clear. In an epic study, the lives of 1,154 people who left Penhurst were followed over the next five years. The study demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that the people who left Penhurst were much better off in almost every way. Initially, many families were resistant at the thought of their son or daughter moving from Penhurst to the community. After all, they had been told that institutionalization was best. But the Penhurst Longitudinal Study demonstrated a huge turnaround as families saw the immense benefits of community life. We'd heard interesting things about the Philadelphia Tunnel. Investigators have been told harshly to get out. We decided to try our luck chatting with that irascible entity.
and any others who decided to show up. If you sit in this wheelchair, I'll give you a ride. I have a meter sitting in the chair, hopefully. Somebody will sit on it. This is a small wheelchair. It's just child size. And there's... system of Philly Hall, the administration building. Uh, I'm an idiot. I blasted myself in the face with my life. <laughs> it's a confusing place. I do. Yeah. Box. Scanning uh, FM. Oh, okay. It's S, 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 uh, S box. Okay. Yeah. Do you want FM or AM? Um, try AM. Okay. Is there anyone here who would like to talk with us? I've been to the Sally House. I was at the Sally House last year. Was it this year? Last year. This year. Wow. Where is that? 
Atchison, Kansas. Just across the Kansas Missouri border. Well, you can say Sally House, can you say the name of this place we're at? Quid. Quid. Quid pro pro? I got it on my voice recorder. Okay. Why do you want us to get out? This is beer right after the name of that beer. <laughs> I wouldn't mind a beer. I wouldn't either. <laughs> We're just here to talk with you, that's all. And we'll leave if you want us to leave. Four. Four. Like the number four. Was interesting. This next bit is not the least bit paranormal in nature, but I found it fascinating and melancholy at the same time. We were all exploring the buildings at our own pace. I was wandering down a dark hallway when I saw a door that was slightly ajar. I couldn't resist that temptation, of course, so I tried to get in to explore further. The door turned out to be blocked by several garbage bags full of books. I couldn't get the door open more than a few inches. I stuck my phone through the crack, snapped a picture, looked at it, and my jaw dropped. Behind that door was a room the size of a school gymnasium, and it was stacked several feet deep with bag after bag after bag of abandoned, discarded books. It was a book addict's dream and a librarian's nightmare in one huge room. One of the most actively haunted parts of Penhurst is in the basement of Devon Hall. This is a children's play area known, ironically, as Candyland. It would be hard to imagine a fouler, less appealing place for a children's rec room. In an effort to get the children down there to communicate with us, I tried my go-to plan of offering them candy. Please note, the basement room was damp, with water dripping everywhere and puddles on the floor, and it was very echoey. 
I apologize for the poor sound quality of the recording, but you'll get the idea of what it was like to be down there in the gloom for a while. And you may, in fact, hear a few answers to our questions. We're down in Candyland in the basement of the Devon building. August 7th, 2020. Watch when you sit down, there's a candy fish on it. Swedish fish, and it's kind of sticky. <laughs> I think it got dripped on. <laughs> that chair was sitting right here. Somebody must have moved it. My name is Sylvia. Can you tell me your name? I came in here earlier and I gave you a piece of candy. Did you like it? It's raining outside. Can you come in here and play? Did you hear? Can you stop that drip? Closed in 87, and that's an awfully modern name. I see a carousel painted on the wall. And there's a lion to ride. Can you roar like a lion? Yeah. Did you hear something too? Oh, oh did I, I didn't hear anything, no. I got my recorder going now. Can you whinny like a horse? I see an elephant on the wall. Can you trumpet like an elephant? Can you see us? 
I'm going to start with the camera on to record the Hell, I guess I don't know. Hell, H-E-L-L. -L. We would like to see you if you want to try to show us where you are. Would you like me to take your picture? Okay. I thought it said yes. Okay. How about if you stand right over there in front of the picture of the carousel, and I will take your picture. Won't that be fun? Are you ready? One, two, Three, smile. I hope I got your picture. <laughs> What was that? Okay. There's about seven toys on the floor that I see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One behind Can you tell me what your favorite food is? Can you let me smell your favorite food? Did you have a pet when you were at home? What's your pet's name? And say hair, H A I R. Do you want to touch my hair? You can if you'd like. You can touch my hair if you want. I don't mind. If I roll this balloon to you, can you roll it back to me? Oh. 
Roll it back to my feet. Doesn't seem like something a child would say. I I see lots of colored lollipops on the wall, too. What's your favorite color? If you make a basket, we'll cheer for you. Did you say that? Ben, I just have Lynn. Johnny and Lynn. Neither names that have never came up on the cover. Who are we talking to? What's your first name? Lynn. Goodbye. it as hard as you can. Kick it towards me. I'm glad we got to talk to you today. Did you have fun talking with us? Just said calcium. What is that talking? Calcium. All right, can you say goodbye, Alice? We're going to get ready to go. Can you say goodbye until next time? Can I keep the talk to all of us? And we're going to stay here if you don't follow us home. Goodbye. I hope you have enjoyed this peek at one of Pennsylvania's most haunted places. In the next episode, we're going to visit an extremely haunted cemetery in Illinois. Be sure to pack your compass, hiking boots, and bug spray the next time we go. Lights out.